Hello and welcome. I'm Tui Vu. Today we bring you another special edition of KQED Newsroom On the Road. Later in the program, as part of the San Francisco Homeless Reporting Project, we'll talk about the challenges of finding a job and working while homeless. But first, we begin here at UC Hastings College of the Law to talk about the week's big political and legal news. Portions of President Trump's so-called travel ban just took effect. The U.S. Supreme Court won't hear the case until October, but the fallout has already begun. And it's been a week of political maneuvering over the Republican plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Also, some significant developments this week in California politics on climate change and other issues. And joining me now are political senior writer Carla Marinucci, KQED politics and government senior editor Scott Schaefer, and also UC Hastings law professor Rory Little. Welcome to you all. Republicans have campaigned on repealing the Affordable Care Act, right? Uh, they now have control of the House, the White House, the Senate, and yet they still can't seem to get repeal done. Why? Well, I mean, look, look at the, this week you had an unusual situation where Jerry Brown, Dianne Feinstein, and Kamala Harris came forward and said, uh, who does this bill hurt? And this is the message going across the country. Seniors, Kamala Harris called it an age tax uh, because premiums may be as much as five times more for, say, a 60-year-old man in Los Angeles making 50000 a year. This, is, this is, goes to the heart of the argument that this is a basically a, a gift to the wealthiest people in form of a tax cut and a huge blow to middle Americans and, and the CBO Americans. and the CBO with this estimate came back and said 22 million mm -hmm. Americans yes. would lose their coverage right. under there, the Senate there, plan. Yeah, exactly. And there's other impacts too. Like uh, KQD just had a story. We sent somebody up to Shasta County, a very red county. And they found that about 900 jobs were added because of the Affordable Care Act, hospitals, mm -hmm. clinics, but also local businesses. They Suddenly folks have health insurance, they're spending money on other things related to health care, and those jobs would be in jeopardy as well. So I think what you're finding is, and you know, Shasta's a place that did not vote for Obama, they don't like Obama, but they kind of like Obamacare. You know, they wouldn't mm -hmm. call it that, mm -hmm. uh, but right. they're, they they're benefiting from it. Obamacare. Yeah, they, I mean, what's happening here is really very political. Uh, the Republican bill now looks like it's going to preserve many of the things that Obamacare did, but we're not going to call it Obamacare. We're going to call it Trump Well, in fact, they're going to say they're repealing Obamacare, which is, right. is not really true. And yeah. so the base will say, you fulfilled your promise, and I didn't lose my uh, you know, uh, protections that I had before. Well, well, Mitch McConnell has suggested, well, maybe I'll go to the Democrats if I can't get this done on the yeah, Republican yeah, side. Like, That's real like, desperation. Not like bipartisanship at all, or you're saying <laughs> not, no way. Not going to happen, not when the Democrats are saying that you're talking about children. Here in California, for instance, Diane Feinstein said this week, um, uh, the majority, from 40 to 80 percent of the children who end up in children's hospitals in California are on Medi-Cal. I mean, I mean th this kind of action is not, gives Democrats no room to support the plan. And in fact, McConnell uh, has basically put them to the side so long. I think that that's an impossibility. Well, and the Democrats are saying, look, we'll work with you, but we're not going to work with you on anything that you call repealing Obamacare, right. you know, because they want to protect his legacy as yeah. well. So they're going to have to, maybe they'll get the Republican votes. You know, we'll see uh, soon, I think. They're going to have to get the votes. Uh, and they don't need the Democrats so long as they can keep their you know, 50. Yeah. But there are issues, you know, women's health care is a big one, and you've seen some of the GOP women senators um, say, I, we cannot support a bill that cuts Planned Parenthood to this, that, that provides uh, uh, health care for so many women in rural areas. There's a lot of issues still to be worked out. Meanwhile, in California, we had a proposal for a single-payer health care bill. Last week, it got polled. Why? Well, the speaker in the assembly said that this bill doesn't, it's an empty shell. It doesn't say how, it's gonna, how we're going to pay for this $400 billion program. The governor was lukewarm on it, and so it really wasn't going anywhere, so the speaker pulled it. But boy, did he get political heat for this, uh, to the point where the California Nurses Association has put out uh, sort of a, a tweet showing California being stabbed in the back by Anthony Rendit. A big bear. Some call, yeah, some calls for his recall. Uh, this has created uh, issues between unions in California. It shows this single-payer issue is passionate it, it, uh, for a lot of folks in California, but how to pay for it, Rendon sort of made the hard call and said, the money's not there. It's going to require a tax. Rory, this week the Supreme Court allowed the travel ban to take effect for now, but gave an exception for people from the six Muslim majority nations with bona fide relationships. So who's allowed in and who's not? Well, it's a good question, and I think you're going to see litigation about this very quickly. The Supreme Court opinion actually said anyone with a credible claim to a bona fide relationship. Now, the State Department says 
certain relationships are bona fide, but grandparents don't count, fiancés don't count. I don't think that's consistent with the Supreme Court's order. I think you're going to see lawsuits very quickly uh, and a lot of litigation over the next few months. Like if, like if you say, I'm Twee's grandparent, can the State Department say, sorry, you can't come in? Are I you saying that's illegal? I, I think it could be illegal. That's because the Supreme Court opinion certainly doesn't say no grandparents. It certainly doesn't say no fiancés. Uh, so the State Department has some discretion, but it's got to be consistent with this order, which was agreed to uh, by the Libs as well as the Conservatives. Uh, the ACLU is ready. They're looking for plaintiffs. I think you're going to see a lot of litigation. Lori, what does this mean for Silicon Valley, where the last travel ban created chaos? You had engineers, uh, folks who didn't have family connections. Uh, unless they have a job now, is that the guideline? Well, I think it's clear that if they do have a job lined up, the travel ban can't be applied to them, if they're from these six countries. Uh, but I think it's also clear that if you're in the process and you create a bona fide employment relationship with a legitimate company for a legitimate reason, again, they can still apply the normal rules to you. They can still assess if you're a security threat, but they can't apply the travel ban. Again, you're likely to see people filing lawsuits. Well, and in their, in their dissent, uh, Clarence Thomas, who wrote it and Gorsuch joined it, he's, they wanted the whole travel ban put in place uh, right. for this reason. They said there's going to be a lot of litigation and you've got now attorneys from immigration groups placed at airports just you know, trying to help people get in when there's a question, but also I would imagine looking for potential plaintiffs right. uh, in, in cases. Remember the chaos when the travel ban one went in and the airports were suddenly full of lawyers and people trying to get in and uh, Homeland Security people who didn't know what to do. I think you're going to see the same sort of thing. Although Maybe the difference weekend. was there was really, that one was just went into effect without any warning. At least there's been some ramp up time for this. Right. Well, the Homeland Security folks, let's say, uh, they've got an order that says no grandparents. But I don't know that the grandparents in the world are going to abide by that. Try to enforce that at like Thanksgiving so what do you dinner. Think right? in October. And, and the other question is the political activism. Are we going to see the same kind of. Well, you know, it's a very good chance that by the time we get to October, the 90 day period will have passed. Uh, they will have done their study. Uh, they will have reported out who's a threat and who isn't, and they'll have more evidence. But, but should they have done that like a long time they ago? They should have done it a long time ago. <laughs> There's I mean, a lot of shoulds here. Yeah, they should have done a lot yeah. of shoulds. But I think we should remember, too, that this isn't just about the travel ban, right? It's about executive authority, presidential power. Yeah. And there are a lot of people on the Supreme Court who feel very strongly, irrespective of maybe how they feel about the travel ban specifically, that maybe, you know, in fact, the president does, should be granted a lot of deference on these sorts of, of I issues. Think, I think that's true, but if you really care about executive power, you want a better vehicle. Remember, this vehicle is really muddied up by the tweets that say things <laughs> yeah. like, well, we all know what this means. The Muslim the, ban. The Fourth Circuit found that it dripped with religious animus. Uh, they don't really want that as their vehicle uh, because it's likely this president is going to do a lot of other things that are going to be challenged. And, and is there a chance that we may see yet another executive order, a third version of the travel ban sometime this summer? Uh, I think you're going to see that as soon as they finish their 90-day review, which I think they must have started this week. Um, and if they didn't start it, then they're going to be in big trouble. Um, and then you'll see another order, and, and there may be challenges to that order, but that order will be crisper and cleaner. Now, to me, it seems like this is really part of a, an effort to discourage immigrants from coming to this country. We've seen border crossings have dropped, international yes. uh, applications to UC and other schools in California dropped. And I think I'm just guessing that that's really what Steve Bannon wants. Yeah. You know, they want to just reduce. They they feel that the influx of immigrants has been really bad yeah. for the country. But the and this climate's is, not good right now. No, no. Yeah. no and for California, not. particularly when you're talking about uh, here in Silicon Valley, uh, from uh, up and down agriculture and so forth, uh, we still don't know the real impact. You know, the state recently expanded its own ban for state-funded travel to certain states. Which states? have been added, and, and why, Scott? Well, it's kind of ironic because, you know, you've got the Attorney General Javier Becerra <laughs> fighting Trump's travel ban, but, you know, California, uh, I believe last year, <laughs> instituted its own travel ban, not saying that state workers can't go to states with public money that are discriminatory toward, you know, LGBT people and others. And so this week, Javier Becerra came to San Francisco and announced that uh, Kentucky, Alabama, South Dakota, and Texas were going to be <laughs> added to that list. Now, those are not necessarily places that are big convention states, shall sure. we say, although Texas is. 
And in fact, there's a, uh, a convention of uh, Latino lawmakers that uh, Ricardo Lara, the senator from LA, is paying his own way to uh, in Texas because you know he feels strongly about being there, but he can't use tax Does, does it make California their... seem, seem hypocritical, though? Yeah. I mean, at a time when it's challenging no. the Trump travel ban, it's saying we have our ban a travel ban of our own. So you're absolutely right. Some of these uh, red states have just come back uh, and, and really criticized California, saying, excuse me, Jerry Brown's going to China, not exactly a bastion of LGBT rights, and, uh, yeah. and yet yeah. this travel ban in, in now eight states. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, they're trying to make a statement here yeah. in California. Yeah, I think, you know, to me, the lesson is you got to pick and choose these things. Because, you know, North Carolina, became, when they passed their so-called bathroom bill, became the focus of attention from the NBA, the NCAA, states like California, and they changed their policy a little, you know, not entirely. So I think, but I think when you begin to add, you know, four states here and three states there, you know, I think it loses its yeah. impact. Also, another big case out of this out of the Supreme Court this week, and that is the so-called cake case. Uh, Scott, take us through that. It's based in Colorado, but has huge implications for same-sex couples um, everywhere. Right. So a few years ago, the Supreme Court uh, issued a decision that basically legalized gay marriage throughout same-sex marriage throughout the country, and you saw different cases pop up. This one, as you mentioned, the cake maker uh, is a masterpiece cake maker. I think it's called. The company uh, had a religious objection. He says, look, I'll serve, I'll sell cakes and cupcakes and anything to my gay and lesbian uh, customers, but I don't want to be forced to participate in a ceremony that I disagree with based on my religious feelings. By the way, the cake maker also won't make cakes for Halloween based on the same premise. And so this is a religious liberties question. And it applies in this case just to a cake maker, but it could be florists, calligraphers, photographers. And it really comes down, it's really the, where the rubber hits the road, this conflict between you know, uh, treating everyone the same versus, you know, religious mm -hmm. liberties. Let me add one wrinkle to this, which is, <clears throat> this is not, does the cake maker have to do this? This is, does Colorado have the power to enforce an anti-discrimination law? In other words, Colorado has made it uh, their business to try to discourage this kind of discrimination. It's not a straight, you can make people to make cakes or not. It's, it's got this state action component, which I think raises some federalism issues. And also, Neil Gorsuch uh, comes from the Tenth Circuit Court, which is based in Denver. And, mm -hmm. and Carla, what was this reputation on that, on that court, especially around cases that involved religious beliefs? Well, and I case. think it, this whole issue of religious freedom, I mean, this is where conservatives, I think, are celebrating Neil Gorsuch being on the court. When you saw the, case, the Trinity case recently decided in which a, a, a religious school was basically given access to public funding, I, I don't know what we can glean from where this is going to go, but Gorsuch's uh, um, presence on the court yeah. certainly is the game changer. And, and this is a case that had languished for a while, presumably because the, there were a 4-4 deadlock. Now, perhaps, we, it's hard to read the tea leaves, but maybe they think, the, the, the four conservatives think that with Gorsuch added, they'll now have a fifth vote to side with the cake maker. Uh, but, you know, who knows what Anthony Kennedy's going to do, too. The case is very similar to this Hobby Lobby case, which was three right. years ago now. Which had where, to do with birth control. And, right, and a religious objection to uh, having to do a health insurance plan that had birth control included. In that one, Justice Kennedy voted with the religious objection. And so here you have that uh, clash. Yeah. Religious objection, Kennedy was there. Uh, Same-sex marriage, he voted, you know, he wrote the opinion, yeah. uh, constitutionalizing that uh, right. institution. When you put those two together, I don't think it's clear where he's going to be. All right. This week, the California Supreme Court had a major announcement of its own. Uh, Carla, it refused to consider a challenge by business groups against the state's cap-and-trade program. Um, take us through that case. And yeah, it's a big victory for Governor Jerry Brown. That's right. This is, this is sort of a legacy thing for Governor Jerry Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I was with Governor Schwarzenegger, former Governor Schwarzenegger yesterday in Los Angeles, and Mayor Eric Garcetti really put it, sort of laying down the, uh, the, the law to uh, Donald Trump on this issue and saying we're going to continue to stand for things like cap and trade. This is a, a, a policy, of course, that was fought by business as a tax, uh, essentially. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, right now it's been given the green light. This is it was a big deal, and it, it, it once again advances the notion that California is going to be the center of resistance on climate change issues. Yeah, and and Jerry, not only Jerry Brown, but when you have yeah. people like Schwarzenegger and Garcetti going around the world and pushing this, I think. But, uh, but on this, yeah. is this the end of the road, though, for legal challenges that can't be appealed any higher? It's Warren? the end of the road for this particular uh, legislation. And the uh, Court of Appeals opinion becomes the governing law of the state. That was only two to one, so it was a very close decision there. 
but it's because it's temporary. In other words, I think they've denied reviews saying, you know, we're going to see this again, and the legislature may do it differently, may, may improve things. You know, this allows businesses to trade, basically, uh, between each other, uh, pollution credits, in a sense, greenhouse gas credits. Um, and they said it was a tax, and the lower court said it's not a tax. It's a regulatory fee structure, uh, which is well accepted in other places, not federally. And talk about Jerry yeah. Brown's legacy. I mean, a lot of that money from that system right. is going to fund high-speed rail yeah. in the Central Valley. <laughs> right. And on that legacy note, we have to end it ourselves. Rory Little, thank Scott you. Schaefer, and Carla Marinucci, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turning now to our ongoing coverage of homelessness in the Bay Area, today we focus on the difficulties faced by homeless people looking for work, the barriers and the misperceptions. I talked with Kevin McCracken, who was previously homeless and addicted to drugs. He now runs his own company. And Andrew Jackson, who recently found housing after living for several months in an abandoned car in Richmond. Also, Dominic Griffin, a homeless single father of two, currently looking for work. There you go. Welcome to you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Pleasure for having us. Well, Dominic, let me begin with you. You are a father of two sons, ages That's four correct. and seven. That's Where correct. do you and your boys sleep at night? Uh, at this moment in time, uh, if not a hotel, we definitely uh, resort to shelters. Uh, if not a shelter, they don't have any beds left, uh, we resort to our car. And how long have you been homeless? Uh, since March 12, 2017, uh, at 6.44 in the morning. It's certain days and certain times that you just don't forget. What happened? Uh, we were evicted from our home because I couldn't sustain uh, the job, uh, the jobs that I had at that moment in time, uh, based on the fact of childcare issues. Uh, it seems that I was making too much money at the point in time, uh, on paper, to where I couldn't get the childcare assistance uh, that I needed. So I had to make the hard choice of going to work or watching my children. I didn't have the stability of family members to help me out as much as they said that they would. So. The word commitment is, it means something to me, but to a lot of other people, it probably doesn't. Well, Andrew, let me turn to you. You just found housing at Covenant House in right. Oakland. Uh, it helps homeless youth. Mm -hmm. And before that, you lived in an abandoned car in Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, did you work while you were homeless? Yes, I did. Previous to going, previously to going to the Civil Corps Academy program in February, I was working at Cafe Soleil in El Sobrante and uh, also a transmission shop in North Richmond, California. And... Um, I was working there for the last four years previous to that, and the Cafe Soleil, I was working there since about November. And Kevin, you were once homeless yourself and a drug addict, and now you run a successful screen printing company. You recruit formerly homeless people and also people who have been incarcerated or suffered from substance abuse. Why is that so important to you? Well, it was an opportunity really for us to get back to our community. And, you know, I'm not a believer in that you can just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You need a lot of support. And the ability of social imprints to give that support is key to our success. So we support our employees that come in. Generally speaking, they come from a varied background of, of barriers to employment, whether it's formerly incarcerated, uh, recovering from substance abuse or educational or economic barriers. And, you know, homelessness is often contributed to by mental, il mental illness and substance abuse and the inability to get a job because you've got a criminal record. So, you know. Yeah. And, and what you touched on is so important, right? Because at the root of all this is that you have to have some level of stability in order to find work. And so, Dominic, what has your experience been like uh, trying to find work while not having a home, and especially as a single father with all the child care responsibilities that you have? Uh, well, it's definitely been a, a difficult road and a difficult task to handle, a big pill to swallow considering the fact that I have two children that I definitely uh, am the sole provider for. Uh, so it's definitely been a little bit rough, a little bit hard, but uh, looking for a job isn't Looking for a job and finding a job isn't necessarily hard for me. It's just getting the proper child care and uh, stability up under me housing-wise to be able to go forth with that. And do you, you and your sons talk about this? Do you explain to them the situation and how do they respond? Uh, well, my oldest is seven, so I explain to him uh, as much as I can, but he has seen He's experienced and seen things that a, a seven-year-old doesn't normally see or uh, go through. So he understands to an extent, and he breaks it down to me as well, like, Daddy, I know we're going to be fine. I know you're going to do this. And I understand it, so he understands. And when you're out there looking for a job, Andrew, do you tell, or did you tell potential employers about your homeless situation before you landed at Covenant House? I always felt like it was the best, it was the best thing to do was to be honest with uh, my employers, my potential employers, to let them know that, hey, I'm in this situation, 
but I'd come professional and I'd let them know that it's not going to hinder me from my job duties or, or my punctuality. So they'd appreciate that, that I'm honest with them, that I need these hours, I need these days, I'm trying to get out of this situation, I'm trying to get to the next better place. So I felt like it was always beneficial. And Dominic, are you honest about your homeless situation when you're out there talking to a per potential uh -huh. employer? I would say yes and no. Sometimes I have been honest, but there is there is this thought in their brain uh, when you are being brutally honest and completely honest about your situation uh, that you might not be able to to come to work one day or you might not be able to fulfill their fulfill their needs. Uh, so sometimes I have been uh, on the line of not letting them know, just trying to get to work and do what I need to do. Uh, with the job. Kevin, you've been in this situation. I know that you're listening to their stories yeah. and it resonates with you. Um, how were you able to go from being homeless to starting your own company? So um, I was actually arrested in San Francisco and um, at the time San Francisco was really starting to push the, the um, rehab versus jail time. So I took the deal that I was offered and went to a, a rehab facility here in San Francisco and they had a whole reentry program. What so, year was this, by the way? Um, <laughs> 1997, 98, yeah, a while ago. A while ago, yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll have 19 years clean and sober in November. So um, I, yeah, thank you. And I can say when I was on the street, I, I commend both of these guys. It is so difficult to show up to work on time with a house <laughs> and kids when you've got things pulling at you. Um, and I've, uh, I've, you know, I have a, a daughter with an ex-wife and was a, you know, we shared custody of her and still do. Um, and just showing up on the days that I had her in the morning was difficult enough having stability. So ha watching these two work the way they are right now, I, I completely commend them. Um, but how did you go from that to having your own business? So a lot of hard work. Um, you know, I worked at the company that I was hired at um, and learned the business. Learned the screen printing yes. business. Um, so I, I learned how to run the press. I learned how to order product. I learned how to do sales. And now you have 35 employees, We do. Right? Yeah, that's 35 full-time employees. Story. And I know, um, Andrew, that you were at uh, Civicor and mm -hmm. you're going through job training. Right. Um, what do you want to be? And, and why are you in that program? What do you hope to accomplish? Well, I, my first son was born May 3rd. So that was the whole reason behind me uh, sticking to this program and making it out from Richmond to Oakland and all that. So uh, my goal is to obtain my high school diploma and then go to college for uh, civil engineering and psychology. Civil engineering because I would like to, I'd like to challenge myself and then apply what I'm trying to construct or improve. And then psychology because I'd like to understand the motivations behind people's actions and why, why we do what we do, why we feel the way we feel. And Dominic, you're still out there looking for work. What are some of the main challenges you're encountering as you're uh, doing your job search? Uh, well, the main thing is uh, the proper child care because the jobs that I go for, they, they're definitely uh, not uh, minimum wage jobs and I can't uh, afford to not have a minimum wage job. I need to, I need to have more than that. So uh, that's been the complication with trying to get child care because once they see, all right, you're going to be making this amount of money, you might not need child care. Well, I kind of do because I'm a single parent of two and my money doesn't just go in the air. It goes straight to my kids, my household, everything that we need. So that's been the biggest uh, obstacle lately. So what is that experience like in terms of your psyche? You definitely have to keep yourself mentally grounded. Uh, so I would tell anybody to stay close to yourself. Uh, most importantly, don't let yourself go because it's so easy to lay down and say, I give up. The hardest thing is getting yourself going to keep striding every time life wants to punch you and knock you down. So what would you like to see done in terms of, is there a way that society or local governments or people can help you on that front? I think the window should be a little bit bigger uh, for single fathers with children. There's a lot of resources that are out there that are willing to help, but if you're not a substance abuser or a female or domestic violence or, or just a woman with children, it's a little bit harder. The windows are, are awfully small for those single parents uh, that are fathers that are taking care of their kids by themselves. San Francisco and Oakland and other cities around the Bay Area spend millions of dollars on programs to help the homeless. Do you, is there something else that you think should be done with that money that is not being done? I would say we need to audit the whole funding system to every, everything involved when it comes to those programs or the money being received, I just don't see it being put to a correct use. There's a lot more resources out there. We just need to rethink how we distribute them. I mean, 
really put forth effort and have the commitment to, to really do what you say. A lot of a lot of government, a lot of companies and big corporations, they state that they would do certain things and, oh yeah, I'm going to fund this and so forth and so forth, but their heart's not really into it. With your heart not really being into it, it's kind of difficult for you to really do the job that you said you were wanted to do. You got to really be committed to what you say. What are some of the common misperceptions that you encounter while while looking for work? Well, I would say professionalism is the biggest misconception because a lot of a lot of employers especially wouldn't believe that you would be in this situation and be able to maintain a, even a, po a positive um, atmosphere or a positive attitude. I think there's too a misunderstanding that how many people are actually working homeless, you know? Um, for myself, the reason I couldn't work was because I was also a substance abuser. It had nothing to do really with the fact that I was homeless and I, I, unable to work, but it is really difficult too, again, going back to getting to work on time you know, the people that we've hired over the years, especially when I was at Ashbury Images, I, I mean, some of the best employees I've ever had. What would you tell other employers about hiring homeless people? I mean, hiring is difficult. It's, it's a hard process. We have an HR person because my partner and I can't handle it. <laughs> so um, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is, is make an attempt. You know, give someone a chance that might need a second chance, a third chance. Um, you will be amazed at the loyalty, the hard work, and what you get back. It will be well worth the investment. Well, on that note, we will end it. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Dominic Griffin, time, Andrew Dominic. Jackson, and also Kevin really McCracken. It's been it. such a pleasure to talk to all three of you. Definitely. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thanks. And that does it for us. From UC Hastings College of the Law, this has been a special edition of KQED Newsroom On the Road. For more of our coverage, go to kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.